Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, the Haudenosaunee, and the land. The treaty was created to share and protect what is still their traditional territory. The area around the Great Lakes represents the dish that we all feed from, and we must share with one spoon. Subsequent Indigenous nations, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in a spirit of peace, friendship, and respect for the land we now share. We are all treaty people who have a responsibility to maintain the spirit of the dish with one spoon covenant. Union solidarity is based on the principle that all union members are equal. Discrimination and harassment weaken our solidarity reducing our capacity to work together on shared concerns, such as decent wages, safe working conditions, and justice for all. We neither condone nor tolerate behavior that undermines the dignity or self-esteem of any individual or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment. So I went off looking for an agent, and I had an agent tell me, well, I already have one black actress on my roster. And I thought, so you got one blonde, one brunette, one redhead. And it was all sort of a lump that, you know, Tabby Johnson, Bobby Sharon, uh, Jackie Richardson, um, Salome Bay, myself, and Arlene Duncan, even though we were different ages, different skills, we were just one lump. So this is around 83, the same agent in 93, 10 years later, when I was putting together Into the Mainstream, literally said, if you know of any good, talented uh, performers of color, send them my way. And I said, well, you've got 12 on your roster already. And she said, yeah, but you know, and I reminded her of this incident. And she said, well, you know, at that time, it just wasn't any work. And I said, was it that there wasn't any work or that there wasn't any talent that people knew about? We started Into the Mainstream. We brought visible minorities, audible minorities, people with accents, disabled performers and native performers together, mm -hmm. right? Because we said these are the people who are being marginalized. We kept hearing casting directors saying, I would love to cast more visible minds. I just can't find them. I would love, but you know, there's only six. And we'd have to use them over and over again. And I said, isn't that called stars? Right, I would love, but you know, I can't put a family together because there's no children. Meanwhile, we all knew <laughs> people. So our first book was 204 people. So whenever we heard that, we went, there. Many of you are here because you loved Sandy Ross. That's why we're all here. What you may not be thinking about is how much Sandy Ross loved us, Actra. We were her family, her friends, her greatest focus of meaning. What you also may not have thought about is why we are ahead, ACTRA, on equity, diversity, and inclusion training. In this year, where suddenly all organizations are awake to how they need to do this, ACTRA is ahead because Sandy Ross thought about this more than 40 years ago and motivated us. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but it does mean we have to stay ahead to honor the legacy of Sandy Ross. The more we pushed diversity and inclusion, the more pushback we got from some of the white actors in the membership. And I remember being at my daughter's swimming lessons on a Sunday morning and a member of Actra White Male came up to me and said, um, you know, you're taking work away from me. And my agent says that, uh, you know, if I were a black actor, I would be working all the time, which of course is untrue and wasn't the case, but uh, this was the perception that was out there and so I actually phoned Sandy and I said what you know what do we do with this and she said ah yeah you know uh, in her laugh <laughs> I've been experiencing that she said from day one and again she came back to the idea that um, in fact if we are supportive of each other's stories if we tell stories that are inclusive then in fact there is room for everyone there's room for all of us 
And when we tell each other's stories and we help tell each other's stories, we're all involved in those stories. Uh, the very fabric of the fact that we are, we share this land means that we are intertwined in each other's stories. She called herself a badass um, and she knew that um, the energy that she brought in the room was, uh, was there to make change and that's, that's what she did in her life. Hello, I'm David Gale. And like the late, great Sandy Ross before me, I have the honor of being the Actra Toronto president. I knew Sandy Ross and Actra was like Sandy's adopted family. Like Toronto was her adopted city. She was born in Minneapolis. And you better believe Sandy Ross would have been proudly masked, out front marching alongside so many others, condemning the unconscionable murder of George Floyd. Sandy was never at a loss for words. And like a close family member, she generally greeted you with a compliment or a comment. During my encounters with Sandy, she always encouraged and celebrated my work with Actra and usually tried to sell me on one of her ideas for a new cooking show. Sandy and I had a few things in common. We both went to university in Minneapolis. We both had the same agent. We both went out for the same parts. And we both loved to laugh. And we both challenged the preconceived ideas of what leadership could be. So it's fitting that on this International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, we are honoring the champions of a more inclusive media with awards named after Sandy Ross. Sandy Ross, who broke through glass ceilings and smashed color barriers, and whose work for diversity, equity, and inclusion forever changed our union and our industry. Congrats to all, and on with the awards. The Sandy Ross Awards have a rich history of celebrating the activism and accomplishments of individuals and companies in our industry who are going the extra mile to incorporate diversity and inclusion into their work. Sandy Ross was the first woman, first black woman and first person of color to be president of Actra Toronto. And she was the founder of Actra Toronto's first diverse talent directory into the mainstream, which continues today at diversity.actraonline.ca. Originally launched in 2016 as the Share the Screen Awards by our friends and former DNI co-chairs Sedna Fiati and Farah Marani, we are pleased to celebrate the work and accomplishments of past winners, including Sinking Ship Entertainment, Don Wilkinson, Hungry Eyes Media, Natalie Younglai, Frankie Drake Mysteries, Tanya Williams, and in 2019, Thunderbird Entertainment and Floyd Kane. Now, normally, the Sandy Ross Awards are celebrated during TIFF as an in-person, invite-only cocktail party. But this year, things are a little different. And because of the pandemic pushing things back, we are celebrating the 2020 winners today on the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. So without further ado, our first winner. The winner for the individual Sandy Ross Award was listed as one of Playback's five to watch in 2018. Starting her career as a script supervisor, she has earned credits on impressive titles such as Queer as Folk, The Listener, Flashpoint, Bomb Girls, Remedy, X Company, and Frankie Drake Mysteries. But even more impressive is her transition into directing. In 2012, she was hired as the second unit director and script supervisor for one episode of Flashpoint. And in 2013, Back Alley Film Productions' Adrian Mitchell hired her as a script supervisor and second unit director for Played. In 2015, she directed, wrote, and produced the short film Milk, which was nominated for the DGC Award for Best Short and has since screened at festivals across North America. In 2017, she offered her script supervisor skills to Shaftesbury for their six-part digital series, Frankie Drake Mysteries, A Cold Case. But in exchange, she asked to direct the project, and she did. And in 2019, she released her own web series, Tokens, which is a web series that tackles cultural stereotypes with grace and humor, a comedy about the actors who find themselves randomly sent to productions who are desperate to hit their diversity quotas, like an Uber for actors. Tokens won the 2020 Canadian Screen Award for Best Direction in a Web Program or Series and has made it onto a long list of film festivals for its unique humor and ability to boldly tackle the issue of tokenism in the media. 
Today, we are pleased to present the individual 2020 Sandy Ross Award to Winifred Jong. Yes. We'd love to have you come to the Sandy Ross Awards to accept the award because you are the winner of the Sandy Ross Award. <laughs> Is that a yes? I'm speechless. <laughs> That's a yes. Nice. <laughs> Yay. Hi, everybody. Um, getting in front of the camera takes a lot more courage than I usually have, but I'm here today to thank you for honoring me with the Sandy Ross Award. Huge thanks to the Actor Toronto membership and the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for this special recognition. I'm not only following the leadership footsteps of those who've been honored with this award before me, but hopefully forging new pathways for those who follow behind me. Creating tokens was a light bulb moment. And by doing so, I realized what it means to take up space and give voice to marginalized communities. It means I can't go back. It means I will ask for diversity and inclusion on my sets in front of behind and behind the camera. It means I want to give first opportunities and support the development of other artists who need to be seen and heard. I'm here before I really started the hard work and so deeply moved that you trust me with this honor way before my time. So that light bulb moment is all it took and I wish that its light will continue to shine for all of us and we all continue to have new ideas, our own new light bulb moments to make this industry more equitable. Thank you so much for this honor. The organizers for this initiative identified a need in our community, the need for writers to test drive their scripts and actors to practice honing their craft. What emerged from these two very individual challenges was an event that sought to bring talented writers and actors, specifically actors of color and indigenous communities together to perform original scenes from completed scripts and works in progress. Some of the extremely talented actor members who have worked the scene include Alicia Payne, Anika Elliott, Lavelle Adams-Gray, and countless others, with the writers including Christopher Yip, Andre Newell, Clint Murphy, and many, many, many more. The event was originally built to be a live in-person event with writers and actors coming together to bring the words on the page to life. But when the pandemic struck, the event moved online, which successfully increased the viewership, accessibility, and allowed the event to reach an even larger audience composed of producers, directors, casting directors, writers, and actors. Now it's in its 13th iteration. This event has helped foster networking and connections between numerous writers and actors, sparking future collaborations and lifelong friendships. Today, we are so incredibly pleased to present the 2020 Sandy Ross Award to... the founders of Working the Scene in Color, Woo! Lou Taylor and Jessica Maya. <laughs> We'd actually like you at the Sandy Ross Awards because you two, in conjunction with Working the Scene in Color, are being awarded the 2020 Sandy Ross Awards. And that's what, no. this, call is, that's what this call is about. What? No, <laughs> no we, don't do, we don't, especially Jessica don't deserve nothing. <laughs> I deserve all of it. I'm happy to take full credit. Isn't that what I said? You guys I thought that's know. what I said. I mean, here's the thing. I know I'm that's just happy you know your place, Lou. Um, Ooh, work yeah. it, girl. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I Thank really you. Really appreciate it. It's so great. Thank you so much to Actra Toronto's Diversity and Inclusion Committee and all the people who have supported us over the years. I'm overjoyed and humbled to be accepting this award. Unfortunately, with Lou, I'd rather accept this prestigious award alone, but here we are. Uh, Jessica is a vampire and into <laughs> zombies. She's in a blood clutch with Samora and Lisa Michelle. <laughs> you might be right about that. Uh, working the scene in color was created out of necessity to bring writers of color, indigenous writers and actor members together. Growing up, one of the things that inspired me to write for TV were all my favorite characters. They were mostly funny women because there weren't enough of us in primetime dramas. So characters like Max Shaw in Living Single and 
Whitley Gilbert from A Different World or even Angela from Boy Meets World. They made every joke land and every dramatic moment touching. We're so grateful to what you do as actors and how you help writers do their best work. We are amazed to be offered this award created to honor the efforts of those following in a Titan's footsteps. I knew Sandy as a tireless exponent of diversity, a raucous laughing force for good. Thank you. Working the scene in color is not only centered on perfecting our craft, but it's a space for fellowship and hopefully hiring each other. And it is happening, which is incredible. There's been a lot of positive advancements in the industry when it comes to diversity and inclusion, but there's still a lot of work to do. When I was a child back in the 50s and 60s, images of black folk and native folk and people of color were virulently demeaning supporting a belief that I and mine were doomed for all ages to be inferior subordinates, a belief still held in some pockets of our culture and a belief we continue to fight today with stories obliterating centuries, spanning lies and brilliant narratives taking us out beyond the limits of human consciousness. We've been here a long time and we've done the work and continue to do the work we're so passionate about and we're ready to drive our own narratives. In honor of Sandy Ross, actor of diversity and inclusion and all those fighting the crucial fight, we accept this award with gratitude. Thank you and trigger on. If you watch anime, like World Trigger. No. Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> Oh God! Congratulations! <laughs> <laughs> Our 2020 Sandy Ross Award winners. So, just for people who might be here for the first time or don't have, don't know much about the Sandy Ross Awards, do Google Sandy Ross after this spectacular, fantabulous woman. If you're just joining in and you didn't hear about that, but when the Actra Toronto Diversity and Inclusion Committee gets together to decide and vote on the winners. It's not something that Lisa, Michelle, and I have the power to select all on our own. It really is a wonderful process that includes all of our engaged members. And the most beautiful part about the entire process is everyone gets to submit three votes right off the top. So it's a beautiful thing when we're tallying up the votes and seeing the common through lines of the voices in the industry that are uplifting our members because you see it don't you Lisa Michelle you see those names that come up over and over again mm -hmm. but the most juicy part of it is when we get into just cutting that list down and saying here's some people who just started this work and we're keeping our eye on them and here are the people who have made profound change and then we go around and all of the members talk about why they selected the person they selected I guess we do that kind of because we want to boost up our Canadian homegrown talent but also because it really lets us see the integrity of the process and hear the reasons. And this one was so amazing because Jessica and Lewis and working the scene in color came up like this and Winnie came up over and over again and the heartwarming reasons why people who aren't even in the projects that maybe you directed or made and hearing the real reasons that our members resonate with the message and resonate with what you're doing. And we always, I feel, have to be in a place where we recognize the work that's being done, congratulate ourselves for the progress that we've made, but keeping an eye on the future and where we want to go. Lisa, Michelle, and I talk about this a lot. Sometimes you want to remind yourself of where you started when you weren't even getting auditions. So there are members who, coming to the workshops at the conferences that Winnie will generously give her time, for example, that might be the only time in, a, in weeks and months that that actor engages with a director one-on-one -on -one like that, gets to try something outside of the box, gets to explore a role maybe that goes beyond um, one or two lines. And we heard that over and over and over again in the members that voted for Winnie is that they feel seen and heard. And then especially when tokens came out, how much that meant to see that representation and to see the, like Winnie, like getting a way into that conversation that felt really good and fun. And then hearing from our members about how coming to working the scene in color gives them a platform and a place to be heard and to play with roles that maybe resonate and speak to who they are, what they're capable of and where they come from. Because when we don't have representation on screen, more inclusive voices, we limit those diverse performers and what they are able to say and you feel unseen. So both of our winners, when we heard our members talk about it, what came up the most was that they felt 
seen and heard. So that's the one thing that always makes us so emotional when we do this because it's so powerful. It's incredibly powerful. Um, it is, and it's remarkable to hear how you can affect someone's life as a performer, as anyone in the industry. When I've heard Jessica, for instance, say that part of her idea for coming up with working the scene in color felt selfish because you as a writer wanted to meet actors and you wanted to get your work heard, but there's absolutely nothing selfish about the endeavors that we do that seem selfish, but when they include others. So everything that all three of you have done have touched our performers in different ways. And it was like Samora said, an easy decision. And it was so fun to see how often your names came up in the process of selecting who should be worthy of this, uh, this honor. One member, a young um, Asian actor member <coughs> talking about how seeing tokens and having the lead character be an Asian woman made her think that it could be possible for her to play a lead. And she was quite emotional when she talked about that. And then we had another actor, a black woman who talked about how some of the best roles she's ever read for were at working the scene in color. So that stuff matters. What y'all are doing matters. And we're so excited to have you here to talk a little bit and talk with our members about the work you've already done, where you're hoping to go with your work and the change that we are promoting in our industry. Cool times. So we thank you for sticking around and having this chat with us. We know your time is valuable because you're all busy, successful folk. So we're just gonna have a quick panel discussion, throw some questions at you to let the folks know exactly what you're up to, what you're about, how you got started and how we can stay connected with you and your fabulous, inclusive work. Yeah, yeah. Yay. And speaking about working the scene in color, a crazy, amazing, wicked, very well engaged, very well attended initiative by actor members and writers alike and a lot of other industry folk. I'd love to hear how you, uh, Lewis and Jessica, were inspired to create the initiative because I think you do exactly that. It has a lot to do with you all believing in writers because what some people don't know is the writers who participate and provide scripts for our actors to do the live read come from a variety of backgrounds. Some of them are super established. We've had Natalie Young live scripts in there. We've had uh, Marsha Green scripts in there, but we've also, you also select scripts from first time writers. It might be the first body of work someone has ever created and you give them the opportunity to have their work read. So what initially inspired working the scene in color and what has taken it to where it is today? The opportunity along with Lewis lambasting them on format. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. The playwrights who are making a transition, but that is so important. About Formatting is important. <laughs> they got to learn. <laughs> they, they do. They do have to learn. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question because uh, at the time, I think uh, Lou and I came up with the idea for working the scene in color uh, separately before we met each other. And so it'd be interesting to hear from, from Lou, like where that came from. But I think for me, um, at the time I was new to Toronto and it was kind of like, in a way, um, an opportunity to meet other writers who look like me and to meet other actors who also were actors of color and it, it's just I always felt like there was like a bit of a a bit of a gap between like the writers and the actors and like I would be just writing scripts uh, by myself in my in my house and I'll be like uh well I want to you know show this to an actor and I want to engage with an actor and like get them involved in this project and how do we get us in a room together and I think I also wanted to just like hear my work out loud and like make sure that this doesn't sound terrible and that I can get some feedback from a supportive community, right? And so I, I started to attend other readings and um, they were mostly, I, I would mostly be the, like the only person or like the second person of color in the entire room. And I just thought that was crazy because I was like, we're definitely out there. Like, why is this not? <laughs> Why is Where this are they? More diverse? Where <laughs> are they? So w at the time that I was like, okay, I need to make this thing happen. Like who, how do I, how do I go about doing that? Um, I was introduced to Lou by Natalie Youngway at a party. I think it was like a holiday party. And she was like, well, you have this cool idea to do this, like, you know, get to like writers and actors together and providing feedback over original and work in progress scenes. And he's got the same idea. So you guys should team up and make this thing happen. And I was like, thank you, Natalie. But I'm also like, thank you, Natalie, for introducing this 
horrible person into my life. <laughs> so she means that with love, folks. It's a double edge. You, know, you know the she dynamics. Doesn't. No, she <laughs> doesn't. Between these two, it's all love. Nope. It's all, nope. I mean, anybody who I, I met, I mean, I'm assuming a lot of people have been to working as any color, which we're so grateful for, like the mm -hmm. audience and the person mm -hmm. that just like it's just amazing to, to, you know, to host these events because they're always so full and there are people like literally standing in the rooms, which is mm -hmm. amazing. But anybody who's met us know our bit, <laughs> like, <laughs> I hope. But I, I do say, I do say it with, uh, yeah, no, I don't. No, 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 stop right there. I don't. Don't break, don't break the window. No, I don't, I don't. Lou, what inspired you to do work in this? alcohol okay well <laughs> you could just steal my answer but but yeah I think it was it was really at first it really did start off as a very a, a bit of a selfish thing like I want to meet more actors but I needed to find that community and I needed to find people who wanted to make the changes that I wanted to make in the industry as well I, I don't think that um, we can just you know we can do our work, but there's also the idea of, you know, um, making a real change and like having, getting people like us in one room and refuting the claims that there aren't enough of us out there because mm -hmm. there are so many of us out so there. Many. Um, I think, right? I mean, for me, it was like, I came up in the days of the Black Film and Video Network, the Racial Equity Fund, uh, I started an organization called Artist Networking Together. Uh, and there's been these periods, um, like I remember the Rodney King riots around 92 and uh, the communities of color were like, we've, we've got to do something. Uh, we have to activate and we've got to change the industry uh, based on that coverage. And um, I think when we were starting uh, when we were conceiving separately, working the scene in color, we were in another period like that, uh, where it's like this, in, it, things have got to change. Uh, Natalie uh, was just starting uh, BIPOC. Mm -hmm. um, there, there was a lot of energy um, and we all felt things had to transition and uh, like with so many people, Natalie was uh, the connecting point. It just also triggers for me the thought that when you have more voices and traditionally marginalized voices or more diverse voices in the writer's room and at work in the scene in color, we see so many varied kinds of stories. I can think of so many off the top of my head that you don't see other places. And it's nice to hear that. And I think that's what affects the change because uh, it ties into tokens as well because the whole, topic that really drives a lot of our actor members uh, up a wall is the idea of, um, Winnie says it much funnier than I will. <laughs> about funnier. How, yeah, <laughs> productions at the last minute are like, oops, we're too white. And then they just need to sprinkle some color on. So they do this arbitrary assignation of actors of color um, in roles that don't make sense. And Tokens is a hilarious um, putting that at the forefront and turning it on its head and seeing how ridiculous it could be. Oh, um, Connie Wong <laughs> actually plays a, uh, a bouncer in one episode, like a tattooed <laughs> bouncer. She plays Sammy Pang and it's so funny. Um, so can you talk about that uh, too, Winnie, how you came up with the idea for tokens, first of all, because what you're both doing really will affect change because when we see more people of color in the writer's room and more women behind the camera and all of that, we will see real change. So tell us how you came up with tokens and then maybe you can all start thinking about the idea of how not only do you create projects or more representation for people on screen, people of color on screen or diversity on screen, but also an inclusive workplace. Okay. Um, so because I was working in the industry, I was generally the only Asian person on set and a lot of times the only person of color on set. And I worked like that for a long time. And so I knew how to navigate that world. And then when I decided I wanted to create my own material and came up with the idea of tokens, the, the funny thing is when I came up with the idea of tokens, it was more about that sort of last minute thing being on call. Um, and so it was conceived of as for actors. So any actor 
being uh, thrust into a last minute audition or last minute, you know, you've been there where you get pages and you have to learn them. And then you have to like be, try and body that character for an audition. So I was trying to put that in a space of actually acting. And it wasn't until I was starting to write the scripts that I like had this profound light bulb moment. And it is really the, genesis of tokens is that I wasn't creating a project for people of color. And like it struck me, I was, I, I realized that I had an opportunity that I could take advantage because I'm, I'm the creator, I'm the writer, I'm the, I'm the, I get to cast it how I want. And so because I realized that I had that power or voice that then I started, like it started snowballing what I can do with that. And of course, um, I wanted it to be funny. I didn't want it to be uh, hit. It does hit hard, but at the same time, I wanted a way in for a lot of people in a lot of ways. It's hard. It was hard for me to try and navigate that whole how do you bring things up how how does someone saying we're gonna have an inclusion writer all of a sudden change the industry it didn't right it it requires people it requires people pushing and so um i created tokens with that in mind knowing that once i started that i wasn't gonna stop and so um i gave a lot of opportunities to first time um women and people of color just come on the set and uh, any project that I do myself, I'm trying to keep to that and just invite people to the sets because unfortunately uh, the reality is a lot of those projects are not as well funded. And um, so we try and keep that community really close. And then hopefully in as I progress, there's gonna be opportunities where I can like use that ladder to bring more people in. Ooh, that's incredible. Producing is such a formidable power because it is incredibly hard work, which I have learned recently, incredibly hard work. But at the same time, you do get to control a lot of the things that are missing in other parts of the industry. You do get to control a lot of the casting, you get to control who's crewing and make sure that the entire thing is diverse, not just the tokens pun intended. Um, mm -hmm. So how would you, for those who maybe aren't there yet, who maybe aren't in creation mode yet, they're still actors who, um, let's say, who haven't created their own work as yet, what would your advice be to them in terms of how to navigate in the industry, how to find places of inclusion, how, what, what advice would you offer to a performer looking for a space for them who identifies di as diverse, either culturally, or in other ways, what would your advice be? And that goes for anyone here. Where should they be looking? What can they do? Or should, should they, they just start them? creating? <laughs> yeah, it's, I think like any industry, it's about connections. Um, you're dealing with uh, a lot of cash, uh, depending on the size of the project and people will work with people that will uh, value add to um, whatever the project may be. And they don't want to risk uh, someone coming on board. My God, I want to swear. Why am I having so much <laughs> trouble not swearing? Um, it's really difficult to break in. And I can't use that phrase either. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> So I could just see the little sensors. In oh, <laughs> it's killing me. Um, nepotism is an awful thing until it works for you. And then it's fantastic. <laughs> so get connected. Um, go through the constant bad stuff <laughs> that, that will come your way. Uh, I, I Okay, but you know what I want to say about nepotism, though? I've spent a lot of time thinking about this because for all of us here, it's not just the work you do that pays you. This is our life's work. We're thinking about it, talking about it all the time. 
I spent a long time thinking, I think nepotism that upholds the status quo is the problem. I think when you're talking about people of color or women who get opportunities from people they know, we worked hard, we busted our butts to do it. And building those bridges and those relationships takes a lot of hard work. I know even just now writing down one of the things Winnie said, but a, a workshop Winnie did before talking about how she approaches that st- strategy of building the relationships and making sure to give and take, and that's how you build. So I think you have to be talented and you have to know what you're doing to get that look, even if someone can help you, like speaking to our actor members who are watching for any other performers, somebody you know can help get you an audition, somebody, and even if you're a creator, someone you know can help get you a pitch. If you're not prepared and it's not good and you haven't put in the time and the prep to make your stuff quality, it's not going to work anyway because we know as diverse people, nepotism for us doesn't work that way. You yeah. aren't getting the job just because I'm buddy's son, <laughs> right? That's not enough. We have to get yeah. there and work twice as hard to get there. So I, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. So I hear you on that, but my whole thing is use your relationships to get where you're going, but make sure whoever it is that co-signed for you you make them look good. Look good. (laughs) And I, and I understand what you mean about the need for being connected. And that's how we get more work. Cause I don't think nepotism is a bad word either. Cause nepotism really is just the capitalization off of relationships and good reputation. And to Samora's point, it's only a problem when it upholds a status quo and it upholds, and that's why it has to be shaken in a certain way. But when it comes to underrepresented groups, that can work in our favor. If I know, if I have a bunch of women and um, other marginalized groups, folks who are talented, capable, and can throw down, why wouldn't I bring them into my projects? And so you have to put yourself out there, take classes, come to working the scene in color, come to one of the many workshops that Winifred has so generously offered uh, at ACTRA through our ACTRA conferences and things like that. You have to show up. So of course, we're all, all of us on the screen here are working toward industry change for the better, but at the same time, to Samora's point, make sure you're ready as that as that shift happens and doors open, make sure you're ready, stay connected, talk to people, take advantage of all the things that are offered to you. Exactly, like working the scene in color is built for exactly that. Like we create an, inc- it's the most inclusive space. It's the most, it's a safe, super safe space and a great opportunity to work on your craft and get to know writers and read all kinds of amazing material, keep doing what you're doing. It's, it's, that's what, working the scene was made for. Um, In talking about um, creating, we talked about all of you all on here, including Samora and I, we're all creators. Very exciting place to be and it takes a lot of work. And to be fair, not all um, actors are are there yet or maybe won't be there, they're all performers. So what would you like to see blue sky from your allies in the industry, from the industry in general? What would you like to see change if you could have anything in terms of a positive shift towards more inclusivity, more diversity, what do you hope to see? Let's say in the next year, let's limit into action, year. right? Because remember, Winnie was talking about how somebody in a position of privilege and power saying we need inclusion riders. We, I hope that, and I know I'm seeing some change for you specifically. How do you see those allies getting activated beyond conversations and words that us in in these groups in these positions we've been having those conversations for years? And according to Lewis, a hundred or so. I've been around since <laughs> I don't remember. But that was Sandy no. Ross too. She started into the mainstream so long ago. So we yeah. are standing on the shoulders of people who have been doing the work a long time ago. It does feel like we're in a place where we're seeing some movement. So in your positions and what you're doing and in our industry, what do you? What would you like to see from our allies? What is your blue sky, like Lisa Michelle said for that? Um, I think part of it is like, I think programming and funding diverse voices is the start because um, there's been so many studies that if you have a showrunner of color, then that equity runs downhill. Like it it seeps into it, hiring practices, it seeps into um, uh, the on what's on, set on screen, it seeps into the stories that we tell. And so with that, then, um, then you have that sort of uh, pathway. And I think, you know, there's not, there has to be some sort of, um, someone has to say, we don't need another medical show. Why can't we have another Asian family at the head of 
a family drama, can there, does there only have to be one? And we have to wait for that one to pass and then green light another one. I really think that um, being the only one of something puts a lot of pressure on creators of color. And so it would be great to have more than just one show like that. That is so true. It does put a lot of pressure when it is one show showing a demographic that is underrepresented. They're expected to cover all the bases and make that entire community happy with that one show. And you're totally right. It's unfair for the creators, the creative team, for the performers, because the show is going to be what it's going to be. And so why does there need to be one? <laughs> Just like there doesn't need to only be one token in a crew as well, or one token on screen. Like we need inclusivity in the programming. I would wholeheartedly agree. It puts a lot of pressure on the audience too, because I know that there's like a rule now in our house that if there aren't women of color and women behind the camera above the line or people of color in meaningful roles in lead roles, we, I just won't watch it. I have to try and create that, that world for myself. Um, but it puts a lot of pressure on the audience too, because not everything can be good, right? We have to be able to, to fail the way other groups have been able to, right? So it puts a lot of pressure on, on the audience too. I think when you only have one show is we either have to Mm -hmm. Embrace a show we might not love. We're terrified it's going to not get renewed for another season. When we should, if we saw more and there were more, like um, when he was saying, shows with Asian families at the head, or Lisa Michelle and I in the Toronto Star interview we were doing was talking about when you see that black family, a complete black family um, on screen, what that would mean. And if we see more than one, I think that's a huge thing that allies can focus on is giving larger budgets to um, more diverse voices. So we see more of these shows and give credit to the audiences and and realize that white people watch diverse projects from, and not just huge like stuff like crazy rich asians black panther but then you have parasite we've seen that work so i just hope that canada that we see our allies show up for us in that way um jessica and lewis what do you think what are you blue skying for your allies uh, in the coming months oh i think that very much connected to what um when he just said which is you know, we have to, um, we also need more than one person of color in that EP position. <laughs> and we also, you know, we also need to be promoting our writers who, of color who are starting in lower level positions. Like they should be moving forward to the next stage in their careers. What, what seems to be happening and has been happening for some time is there's been a lot of, um, great opportunities for some writers, but also some performative opportunities where you'll see some of the writer's rooms and it's like, oh, that person, the only person of color in the writer's room is also the assistant or they're just a coordinator. And it's like, okay, so hopefully by next year, they're actually just a like writing on staff. Like we need to be prepping for the next the, for, for actual advancement in our careers and like not being afraid to cast a person who has the great resume and who has been doing certain parts, but pushing them to be the lead in a television show. It's like, it's, it's the advancement that I think is something that I'd like for our allies to pay attention to and to give us those opportunities to actually drive those narratives mm -hmm. because to get to a point where there are many different shows that feature many different experiences from mm -hmm. people of color, we need to be prepared for those roles. And like you mentioned, uh, Samara, we need to have the opportunity, we need to be given a chance to learn and to perhaps sometimes fail as well. Because people, you know, white showrunners who have failed before will get a show next year. But if we fail, it's like we don't see another show for another 10 years. It becomes, see, this is why we don't this have writers is, of color. Exactly. Meanwhile, if that person were allowed to try and fail and try and fail, they'll only Exactly. <laughs> but, but what happened is that we've been set up to fail, you know, because like we're not given the proper amount of support. We're also not given a proper amount of agency too. And so... To, to get to that point, let's start, you know, getting people prepared for those roles so that by the time that we're 
ready to start show running that, you know, we're, we're not coming in there going, you know, <laughs> like, you know, all the pressure is not put on us to make a perfect show or to, you know, like make this, uh, make this last for like four years because we were terrified that if this show doesn't work out, we won't have another one. I think that's completely unfair and not the same amount of um, expectations that they put on writers who are not people of color, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's uh, promote us and <laughs> definitely, uh, you know, let's, let's, not, let's not keep us in like positions that, you know, lower level positions for five years only to prove that we can definitely a, a do junior work. is no longer a junior after five exactly. years basically. exactly <laughs> yeah wholeheartedly do you, whole do you think that um sorry do, but don't you think right now this I feel like this year has been a watershed moment I mentioned it on another panel before like there has been um a bigger shift than I've seen in the 20 years I've been in the industry. Um, people call me now that, you know, that didn't before. And maybe it's because I've been doing a lot more work and maybe because I'm out there being outspoken as a activist, perhaps asking for inclusion. Um, but I feel like, you know, while I created tokens and I've always been a positive person. So I feel like in a lot of ways there's been a significant change recently and I I want to acknowledge that as well I I would definitely agree with that like of course we're all doing this work and this inclusivity work because it needs to be done but I would agree that it's not for naught there has been change and there's been significant change in this past uh 365 days because personally and anecdotally I was seen and booked a role that I would have never been seen for before like I was a romantic partner and that seems so silly I have a romantic partner I like to think I'm lovable but that's just not the kind of thing I'd be seen for I I, I booked a role they didn't ask me to take out my braids which always happens because <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, usually it's a little too we wanted black but like that's too black kind of thing but that didn't happen and I was so surprised by the role and then wasn't surprised after to learn um well I knew at the time the showrunner was black and then I happened to know one of the writers and he showed me a picture of the writer's room a full room of people of color. So it was no accident that I was seen for something I'd never been seen before. So I agree that the shift is happening and I think it's happening because they're not just looking for tokens to show up in front of the camera, but there's change happening in all aspects of the industry, including writer's rooms. And to Jessica's point, we need to see more, <laughs> of course. Um, yeah. But I do see a shift in other aspects of the industry and that could only help us all. When it happens in one area, it happens in another and it happens in another and everyone gets work. There's enough pie for everyone and it doesn't need to be so tightly held on to. Yes, if and I, I mean, can... I wasn't saying that to denounce the change that oh, no. is happening, yeah. but I but I do want to bring light to that, that, you know, mm -hmm. um, the advancement is something worth asking for given that there are, it's still kind of happening. Oh, <laughs> so, no. there's, so there's still kinds. definitely room there's for improvement. Two sides to the coin. You, there's room yeah. for improvement and you can acknowledge positive change. There is exactly. like, both realities happening at the same time. Exactly. I just wanna, um, I, I think one thing that um, I'm hoping for and I'm seeing is that our internal alliances uh, bear greater fruit. They've already, uh, as communities of color, we forget we are not one unified group, but I think over the last year uh, across the communities, we've seen um, much more support for each other, right? So that's what's important for me that our alliances um, outside our uh, specific communities um, and, outs and outside of the white category that we uh, continue to form alliances and advance. And um, a big hope for me is that people recognize the, pl the plethora of platforms mm -hmm. and ways to be seen 
that do not involve some green lighter in an office on the 25th floor of whatever. Uh, that especially to uh, creators coming out, uh, coming up, there are so many outlets where you can legitimately fail. Like writers used to be the only ones that could put a, their first or second or third script in a drawer never to be seen again. Well, now writers, directors, producers have that opportunity to experiment, fail drastically, uh, and not have blown their career in a specific industry. So I think as long as we can still um, recognize uh, that we're in this together, as long as industry players recognize, uh, get beyond their fear of the changing demographics uh, and the changing the profit streams uh, that they actually am, find a way of embracing these radical changes that are happening like across the board, uh, then I think we're gonna see uh, less and less, I don't wanna say tribalism, but uh, ne negative tribalism. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here, but I want to end up on like a really extra positive note. Not that what we were talking about wasn't positive enough, because we talked about forward movement change and all that good stuff. But what's your blue sky? What's next for you? And what do you want to be next for you? What are your big projects coming up that you're excited about? What are you passionate about for you? It's, anyone can start with that. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh, our as I was saying, our web series, uh, Spawn and Geezer, uh, is up on Sika TV. It's basically a 13 episode series with my kid and I, um, me as the black aging out hipster-esque codger, and my kid is the depression, uh, depressed, non-binary, gay, mixed, anxiety ridden child. Um, so we're starting to do good numbers. So that's great. And the next project uh, is one dear to my heart. It's uh, called Strippers Boys of Sin. And it looks at the first generation of male strippers in Toronto in the early 80s. Um, and the first generation of men that, that I know of that have faced uh, the female gaze as an object and what that what that puts you through psychologically based on a true story. Wow. Sounds deep, sounds very deep and actually a, not a very examined topic about um, males through a female gaze. Um, mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting to hear more. Uh, what about for Jessica and, and Winnie? What's next for you? Go ahead, Jessica. Sure. Uh, well, right now I'm working, I wrote an episode for, um, or co-wrote an episode for uh, Children Ruin Everything, which Ooh! is a half hour comedy. Yeah. They do. Comedy. Yeah. <laughs> so we're in prep right now, and then we're going to be in production. So Very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah, thank you. So then that's that's great. That's coming up. Uh, other than that, I'm just working on, um, well, not currently at the moment because it'd be too much, but I have a couple of projects um, in development, which I'm very excited about. Uh, one of them being a tween mystery series and another one being a, uh, a drama. So um, yeah, there's a lot there's a lot happening, so I'm very excited. And nice. yeah. yeah, I love the words in development. You know what that sounds like? Work for our actual members. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, That's, it is. That sounds great. I'm very excited about it. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent, Winnie. What's next for you? Oh my God, I have so many things on the go. As you know, I've got like a stove full of pots that are brewing. Mm. Um, of course, I'm getting ready to shoot Token Season 2, which we were 
fully financed for. Okay. And we're also developing a half hour comedy version of tokens um, and seeing going to market with that. Um, and I, there's a project that I'm working on that is, uh, I can't talk about, but I have a very new position on it. And I'm looking forward to like expanding um, my learning curve. So Ooh, I can't talk it, about that. Is it your new project or are you going to be the new person on this project? I'm the new person on this project. Oh, nice. Exciting. Yeah. Exciting. We'll watch for that. Yeah. And so, and then, oh, my short film, which um, was a little short film that I did, is going to be screened at um, the Christy Pitts Film Festival. Oh, Yay. congratulations. Yeah. That's great. Once again, congratulations, first of all, on winning the 2020, even though we're in 2021, you know what it is, the Sandy Russ Awards for all the fine work that you do, your commitment to diversity and inclusion in your work. Working in this biz is hard enough, wholesome enough, and you still make room for others. And as you said, you believe in others so that more opportunities can spring forth. And for that, we are really, really grateful. And all of you have given so much time to ACTRA and ACTRA Toronto members for mm -hmm. us to move forward and for us to break through some of those barriers that exist in the industry between actor and writer, between actor and creator. Like a lot of those times there's just, just systemic gaps that just have to exist in a lot of realms, but you really have closed that for a lot of our members and created actual working opportunities. And we, were, we have a lot of gratitude for that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you to everyone for tuning in with us today. Remember to check out Tokens, all six episodes and a whole lot of awesome behind the scenes are available on YouTube. And look out for the next Working the Scene in Color. You can join the Facebook group to get updates on the next session. Or if you're an actor member, you can join the DNI committee newsletter to get email updates by emailing torontodiversity at actortoronto.com. That's torontodiversity at actortoronto.com. Thanks and good night. <laughs>